Hey everybody, welcome to the Hoover Institution workshop on using Texas data and policy analysis. This workshop features applications of natural language processing, structured human readings, and machine learning methods uh, to Texas data to examine policy issues across a wide range of fields, economics, history, national security, political science, and, and many other social science fields. I'm Justin Grimmer, Steve Davis, and I co-organize the workshop. Today, we're thrilled to have Arthur Sperling, who's Professor of Politics and Data Science at NYU. He's presenting a paper co-authored with Pedro Rodriguez and Brandon Stewart. It's entitled, Embedding Regression, Models for Context-Specific Description and Inference. Some quick rules before I turn it over to Arthur. Arthur's gonna speak for about 30 to 40 minutes. If you have questions, please place them in the Q&A feature. Steve and I might interject if there are pressing questions and Arthur or Brandon, who's here as well, one of his co-authors, might respond to clarify questions in the Q&A. Or Steve and I might recognize you and ask you to ask your question live. After about an hour, we're going to turn the recording feature off and we're going to turn it over to a more informal Q&A session. And there you can ask more nuts and bolts style questions as well as uh, drilling deeper on any remaining questions that you have. So with that, Arthur, take it away. Thank you, Justin, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure to have so many uh, people online, and we look forward to a, a fruitful uh, discussion today. So I'm Arthur Sperling. I'm presenting this paper that's called Embedding Regression, and my co-authors are uh, Pedro and Brandon. I'm also going to present some extensions of the work with uh, Elisa uh, Bershing today, um, but that will be uh, later in the talk. So I want to start out with some um, images of political elites uh, you know, having debates or having meetings and thinking about uh, meaning. And that's, in a, in a way, a sort of strange, abstract thing to think about. But for example, right, we think about Republican and Democratic elites, or indeed Republican and Democratic voters. And what do they understand by the term immigration? What do they mean by that term? And they think about what an immigrant is, and discussing immigration with each other, as at one point uh, uh, Biden and DeSantis were. What do they mean by that? Do they mean people who are potentially undocumented? Do they meet people who, you know, come as students, become green card holders, become citizens? What is their understanding of that term? If we think about um, the historical record in the 20th century uh, between the UK and the US, uh, what do um, elites in the UK and the US understand by the term empire in the post-war period? So here's a couple of elites. We've got Macmillan here, part of this uh, prime minister in the UK when it was going through decolonization, particularly of Africa. And uh, we have Kennedy here, right? And they had many discussions about uh, what the role, basically reduced role of the UK would be in the sort of post-war uh, order, right? What did they understand when they talked about empire? And then finally, uh, you know, maybe a more recent example, which is connected to sentiment. So that is to say our affectation about how we feel about things in terms of how we understand them. Um, what is the, 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 the meaning that say conservative backbenchers in the UK who pushed for Brexit uh, essentially all my lifetime, right? what do they infer when they hear a term like the EU? How can we think about what that means to them? How would we measure that? So at a broad level, those are the types of problems we're gonna be uh, dealing with today. So what do we mean by meaning? Well, if you um, spend any time in linguistics, you will see this quote. Uh, you probably won't read the underlying uh, uh, book, uh, collection from which it's from, it's a quote uh, by Firth in 57, says, you know, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. And this and similar sentiments have come known as the distribution hypothesis. So this is the idea that if we see two words in the same context, and I'll be quite specific about context in, in a minute, but for now you can think of it as, you know, uh, with the same words around them. If you see two words that appear in the same context, we might infer that they mean the same thing. That's not the same as knowing their meaning. It means more that we think that these two terms probably mean the same thing as each other. That's, that's the nature of it. Nonetheless, right, that should help us uh, make inferences across context. So if the context differs for a word, that might tell us that these uh, terms mean something different. And just to make this uh, idea firm, Suppose that we observe that Republicans, elites, voters, respondents, whatever it might be, um, they tend to use the word illegal when they're uh, talking about immigration, as in the term illegal is, is close to the word immigration in, in their speeches. But we also observe Democrats don't do this, right? 
then we might infer that there's something different that's meant uh, by immigration by these two different these different groups. And we're going to try to make that very um, uh, firm and specific in what follows. So what we're doing here is assuming some sort of kind of bare bones structuralist account of language. So meanings are different if distributions are different. And so the problem is uh, to work out if those distributions are, are different. So this isn't a sort of deep understanding of language where we're trying to think about uh, what's going on in terms of the chemical reactions in someone's head, in their brain or something, right? It, it's, we're gonna compare some distributions. We're gonna have some machinery for doing that. And that's going to be how we think about it. The way we're gonna do this is with word embeddings. If you're not familiar with word embeddings, I'm gonna give you a very, very uh, brief crash course. So what are they literally? They are real value vectors of numbers. So if you um, ask for an embedding of some word like cat in English or uh, chat in French or something like this, right? Um, I would give you back some length, say 100 or 300 set of numbers. And where do they come from? Well, typically they come from some sort of predictive problem. So we're interested uh, in some, maybe in some elaborate neural network uh, of predicting the probability of the next word given the word that we've just seen. And of course, we can think of industrial examples of this. So for example, um, you know, on your phone, if you have predictive texting or something, that's an attempt to do this problem you know, in, in real time very, very quickly. Um, but things like ChatGPT are trying to do the same thing too. They're trying to predict the next word uh, given what was written before. And that's more complicated in that case because they're predicting lots of words, but that's the basic idea. So here's the idea, right? We might be interested in what's the probability of seeing the word immigration given we observe the word illegal, and that might be high for one group and low for another. And so you'll see uh, you know, uh, pictures like this of neural networks. This is a very famous um, particular case called word -to -vec. Um, And the idea is that there is a weight matrix on the left-hand side and our embeddings, which are these vector representations of these words, come from those weights. This attempt to say, fit uh, these, these models perfectly where we're trying to predict the next word given the word that came before. So again, just to fix ideas, I want to think about um, a sentence like this. I had a cup of coffee this morning and we're looking at some English corpus and we observed this sentence, right? And we'd like to know perhaps the relationship between coffee and cup uh, and coffee and tea and cup and tea or something like that. And so here's a, here's a context, a two word context. That would be small for most kind of real life industrial applications, but still this is a small, uh, this is a, a context around a word like coffee. And if we observe that enough, right, we may infer via these weights, via these embeddings, that cup and coffee are in some sense close together. Um, so in this case, they have this kind of close physical location, but we may infer that they, their embeddings lie in, in a similar, not far from each other. And so we infer these must have something to do with each other. Now, what if I continue reading this English corpus and I see, you know, I have a cup of tea this afternoon. So this may help us infer that uh, tea and cup are close together. And in fact, even if we never see uh, coffee and tea in the same context, in the same sentence, by a cup, we might infer that they're somehow related. Uh, in this case, you know, they're both drinks. Cup is not a drink, right? But it's something that we use for drinks. And so we infer that these words are uh, you know, close in, in some space. So to be clear, these word embedding approaches are popular. I mean, that's something of an understatement, I think. So in the original uh, two, um, uh, you know, big architectures that you'll see in, uh, well, in academia and other places are something called word and something called glove, which was the latter, was designed at Stanford. And um, these have hundreds of thousands of citations by now. So, uh, you know, this is 100,000 citations of these just three papers. And this is sort of under counts it really because um, these are used in industry all the time where, you know, they may not be cited. So they're very, very popular ideas, basically. And we're seeing them in social science too. So you will see papers uh, already about things like, can we think about social class through embeddings? Can we think about um, uh, how media attention to terms like equality, or rather how the media um, reports on different subjects and tries to think about them through an equality lens, how has that changed over time? Uh, people have studied, um, how parliaments, the ideological uh, arrangements in parliaments have changed based on embeddings. So these are out there and people are using them and they're, and they're very popular. And this in a way is our sort of jumping off point to get into our paper. 
So hopefully, you know, embeddings are good. They're very widely used and they're given a bit of a crash course in terms of what they mean. But in practice, when we think about what social scientists want in, on an everyday basis, they want a bit more. So it's not just that they want embeddings you know, of some political terms, though certainly that's helpful. They want to, in fact, quantify differences in meanings as those meanings um, occur to say in different groups. And they'd also like to talk about associated uncertainty, right? So they want to talk about, is there a statistically significant difference between Republicans and Democrats uh, you know, on this subject as, in, as regards this embedding, as regards their understanding of a particular term. So we call that general demand embedding regression. Uh, and I hope that we have uh, supplied a solution to it, but when we use the term embedding regression, we mean uh, resolving this issue. And we have in mind, again, just to fix ideas, something like multiple regression. So you're gonna have embeddings on the left-hand side, and I'll go into some detail about how we, why that's a trickier problem than it first appears. And then we're gonna have some group memberships on the right-hand side. So I'm gonna be able to talk about you know, the effects of belonging to some particular group in terms of its sort of outcome, uh, uh, its embedding outcome. So here, for example, X1, X2 could be group memberships, although in fact, um, they don't need to be uh, binary and they could be something more interesting. So I'm going to set up the problem um, first in a sort of um, sort of small way where the issue is will show that it's technically solvable um, in, a, in a, an easy part of the problem, and then we're going to lead to a more difficult part of the problem. So obviously, just to be clear, embeddings um, are, um, are are not scalars, right? So they're not a single term. So an embedding I is you know it has some long vector representation. So we need a little bit of machinery to sort of take care of that. You can't just stop everything into a multiple regression and you know, off we go. So what we do in the paper is we set this up as something called a multivariate regression. And um, as I say, this is the kind of easy part of the problem. So uh, these regressions are maybe well known in psychology where you have a multiple stimuli or a stimuli, you're trying to understand how it affects multiple outcomes. So I believe in that discipline, they measure things like um, blood pressure and heart rate and the, um, uh, the convic conductivity of the skin and so on and so forth. You have these sort of multiple measures and you want to see how that uh, is affected by some X changing. But just to fix ideas, right? Notice that Y for us is going to be a matrix. We're going to have these N number of these embeddings and they're going to each be of dimension D. Okay. So that is, just so you see what an embedding looks like, it looks something like this. So this is a YI, this is some embedding of some word. And that is what our dependent variable matrix looks like. We wanna have that on the left-hand side and we wanna have group memberships on the right-hand side. Okay. But in a way, let's say that's the straightforward part. The hard part is this part here. So if we wanna set the problem up that way, I need uh, single uh, embeddings each time, right? So what I'm saying is every time someone whether they be Republican or Democrat, uses a term, I would like to have an embedding for them of that term's use. Um, it is straightforward, and you could do it in two minutes uh, to go and find out what is the embedding for the word immigration in um, you know, the discourse. You just download something from the Stanford website, look up what it is, that's the embedding. Right? That's not what we want. We want an embedding for every time that term is used. Right? So if it's used three times in a speech, I want three uh, embeddings uh, on the left-hand side. And that's a hard problem. It's a challenging problem. So we turn to some earlier results, uh, in this case from Aurora. So it says that if you have a word, this is the nature of this result. It says if you have a word, you could uh, get an embedding for it by merely okay, taking the mean of the embeddings of the words around it. So generally, we think that those embeddings we could get from something like uh, this glove uh, database, this big glove matrix we could download in, in two minutes. And I would just look around the word that I care about, take the average, and that should give me a good representation of that particular instantiation in that particular speech of that word in, in, in some embedding space. So here's an example from someone's uh, memoirs, right? The, uh, the debate lasted hours, but finally we voted on the bill and it passed with a large majority. But I've got the context of the word bill and I want an embedding for that term. Not bill in general in the discourse, but bill here in this memoir as, as written by this politician. 
So what should work, um, almost works, not quite, uh, is taking the mean of a previous embedding that we got the voted on the and it passed. The problem though, is that we need to downweight directions of function words. So in that previous slide, we had words like uh, it, um, for, or whatever it was, right? And that's not very helpful, and it tends to overwhelm um, our embeddings. There's lots of these uh, function words, and we end up kind of with a, um, a very noisy embedding that's not really reflective of how people are using Bill in that particular sentence. So we turn to uh, uh, some previous work that uh, Brandon and colleagues did, um, which suggests multiplying uh, this mean by a transformation matrix A. This is the formula for obtaining A. Um, that's not new to our paper, but we do apply it in our paper. It turns out this can be learned relatively easily from a large corpus, and you only need to do it once. So once you put together this A, which is D by D, so if you are embedding the 300, uh, dimension 300, you're gonna have a 300 by 300 matrix. And then if you want a new embedding, that is to say, I want an embedding of my special word bill as used by this politician in this memoir, right? take the average of the words around it, so use, and I multiply by this A, and I get out some uh, nice, uh, very uh, um, uh, precise, what is called a la carte embedding. So in what follows, sometimes I'll say ALC, and I'm referring to obtaining this A and then multiplying it by the averages and the embeddings that we get from that. But ALC is just a la carte. So let me just give some intuition about what's going on with this, this A matrix, uh, what, what, it, what it looks like and, and what it does for us. So what's going on in the, the uh, over here in the, in the sort of right part of this, um, this optimization? So VW is some original embedding from some, from some large corpus. So earlier I spoke about things like Glove, which is a resource that's been trained on various things like Wikipedia uh, for modern English, right? Where uh, we can go off and get a, a bunch of um, uh, embeddings for, for various words. So I said that in principle, you could get a, an embedding for the word bill from, from Glove, okay? And then we've got this A multiplied by this mean, so where the mean is the uh, mean of the original embeddings from the big corpus, but now applied to our little focus corpus, for example, the memoirs of some politician. So what I'm saying intuitively is, is the following. Uh, give me an A matrix, which when I multiply it by the averages of the embeddings around the word that's very specific to my person using this very specific term in his particular memoir, right? Um, gives me back embeddings that are sort of as close as possible, subject to this particular optimization, to the original embeddings. Right? So it's saying, look at these glove embeddings, right? Give me back an A matrix, which sort of pushes that mean towards those original embeddings. So what's happening? Well, as I say, right, I, I don't just want to take the mean of some words around my kind of focus corpus, right? So um, let's say uh, I have, I'm interested in the word like rights, which I was interested in for actually for different projects of some 17th century uh, pamphlets, right? I, I don't want it to become overwhelmed by the average of the and of, right? That doesn't seem like the, the right idea. And the A matrix is in some sense preventing that from happening. The intuition is it's, it's forcing, um, that new embedding, that very, very specific embedding for my very, very specific use of this term to be at least somewhat similar to pulling it back towards what we learned about rights from say Wikipedia, as in the embedding for rights, right? And that stops it getting pulled away from, uh, from it stops it just reflecting function words. The other thing that we sometimes uh, have, and there are different ways to do this, is we also have a, uh, a sort of a, a, a count waiter. Um, what's going on here is that basically this is reflecting the fact that we, um, we are more confident in some embeddings than we are in others. So if you think about even in a large corpus, right, we're a bit more confident when uh, for words that we see all the time, uh, we know a lot about them and some more, uh, some 
the less common words, right, we, we're sort of less confident in. And this helps us uh, sort of reweight towards the, the more common words. But it avoids us, again, because we typically use these log functions, it avoids us becoming overwhelmed by these, these function words. Okay. So why does this matter? So that was a disquisition about uh, these technical details, right? So who, who would care about this, right? Why is this important for understanding uh, meaning, at least as we uh, uh, first uh, discussed? If I can produce embeddings for any word, then I can produce them for any instance of any word. That's the idea. That means I can set up that matrix on the left-hand side in that regression equation, and then I can go off and do my regression. So does it work? Well, let's take a look at, say, New York Times mentions of lowercase t and uppercase t trump. And we're going to provide ALC embeddings for everyone and see if they're different across but similar within. So that is to say, just to clarify the problem here, right? Let's take a sentence like this. Who is this talking about? This is talking about the named entity Donald Trump, right? Capital T Trump, that's who it's referring to. And I would like my embedding for capital T Trump uh, to sit near the other embedding for capital T Trump. So I'm going to try and get an embedding, an ALC embedding for this one instantiation of Trump and see if it works. And just for visualization, we're going to put it in two dimensions, but you could, there are all sorts of ways that you, you could measure this. Okay. Then we had another incidence. Let's build an embedding just from this tiny little fragment. There it is. Okay. Now we're finding a Trump that's not this named entity, capital T, proper noun Trump. It's a reference to bridge or some other card game. We'd like to see that to not be too close to the other capital T Trumps. And we continue to do this and we find that ALC is doing it. So what's going on here is we're saying uh, every time it finds the word Trump and it builds this embedding, this really specific embedding locally to this one use of the term, right? When we then look at that in two dimensions, they're sufficiently far apart that we believe these are different uses. That's great. So it's doing it off one particular use. They also make sense, and I won't belabor this too much. I'll just say that if you look at the right columns here, transformed and transformed, right, these are what we call new, good nearest neighbors, right? So these are things that we think are kind of, should be close to a word like capital T Trump. Capital T Trump sort of should be close in some space to Biden, right? Uh, lowercase t Trump should be close in some space to, uh, you know, bidder, bids, uh, uh, spades, things like, you know, bridge game. The other thing that we do in the paper before we get into our applications is we do a replication of a sort of what is state of the art, which is uh, Emma Rodman's paper in, in political analysis. And she looks at, uh, in the New York Times, for example, she looks at, uh, on the bottom here, bottom left, she looks at the distance between gender and equality, right? So it's trying to understand, you know, how has that distance moved over time? Is gender talked about in terms of equality or is it, you know, discussed in some other frame. So she has all sorts of uh, very nice and carefully done hand coding stuff. And then she looks at a particular model, this particular uh, chronological model, which she recommends for end users. And we replicate her analysis um, and we have almost identical patterns. So the thing to notice from this graphic is that our ALC line basically moves as her line does for all these different subjects. But I want to emphasize the speed. So to fit the types of models that she's interested in, She's taking about five hours on this corpus, and we're going to get done in about a second, something like that, right? So this is just very, very fast and pretty accurate, right? So we have this sense of we feel happy about this, that it works. Okay, well, let's get into back into this regression business. So just a slight abuse of notation here. Let's suppose that I have uh, two groups, group R and group B, and we'll assume they're binary. So you're either in group R uh, or you're not, and therefore you're in uh, uh, group D. So here is the, the modeling problem. I want to have my embedding on the left-hand side. I want to regress it um, on uh, whether you're in group R or not. And then I want to draw some conclusions. So to reiterate, each yi is a one by d dimensional vector, which has come from this ALC uh, instant, um, instance of the word, like those Trump examples in the New York Times. And group R is just some indicator taking the value one you're in, well, you could say in this case, if you're a Republican, but there's nothing special about that and takes the value zero otherwise. So let's think about what we get out here, right? If I fit that regression using this multivariate setup. What is beta zero, right? Or my estimate of beta zero? Beta zero is going to be this. It's the ALC embedding 
for this group D. It's sort of an average of everyone who's in group D. Because the Republican, you know, mechanically will take the value zero, and so beta 1.0, so we'll be left with beta zero, which will be the average embedding for this group D. What about beta zero plus beta one? This will be the average embedding for group R, right? We're just adding two things, right? And we're going to end up with, a, with a, an average embedding for Republicans. We have some various ways in the paper to think about the magnitude, and we take norms and things. Um, there isn't really a natural way of uh, interpreting the, the you know, beta zero or beta zero plus one, right? But you do get two sort of uh, average embeddings. In fact, right, uh, one thing that previous discussions said on this paper is um, this seems like a machine, fast machine, uh, maybe an accurate machine for producing average embeddings for groups. And we would say, yes, that's what it does. Uh, and that's why it's a helpful thing to do. We have in the paper, we have various um, uh, ideas or uh, we show how you can quantify uncertainty here. We use some sort of ideas and tricks from previous papers uh, to so we can talk about something being statistically significantly different. Basically, the permutation in Y, and there are various ways that you can bootstrap things as well. So let me work through some applications from the paper. So firstly, one of the things that we wanted to check is that, you know, um, what terms do Republicans and Democrats, these two groups, uh, I think this is in the, yeah, in the congressional record, what terms do they have just different understandings of? And again, if you want to interpret that as different uses of, that's fine, right? So the big ones, the ones with the largest differences are immigration, marriage, and abortion, and the ones with the smallest differences are these function words. So they sort of have these same understandings of these function words. You might be thinking, well, wouldn't we want to have continuous covariates? You know, wouldn't I want to regress it on something like a nominate score? And you can do that. That's no problem, right? So this is um, the distance between um, uh, these various terms, which I've written on the right-hand side of the plot, and um, uh, immigration, right, as we move from the leftmost uh, uh, House members to the rightmost ones. And so we see, for example, that um, over here on the left, so you think these are mostly Democrats or liberal Democrats, right? Um, the, you know, they, for example, a word like bipartisan is quite close to the word immigration. Um, and then as we move across, it's, you know, Republicans to the right don't use that term when they're thinking about immigration. A word like illegals, not really used very much on the, on the left-hand side of the chamber. Again, in, in connection with immigration specifically, but as we move to the right, it's used more and more. So this kind of makes sense. What about our uh, case of uh, the UK versus the US, right? So um, what we compare here is two completely independent corpora, right? So we're looking at the US uh, Congress congressional record and the UK Hansard over approximately the same period, just before the Second World War till you know, almost modern period, right? And we're looking at how they understand the term empire. And you see this kind of once and for all decrease in coastline similarity because they stop talking about empire in the same way. Uh, we can be specific about that. So basically what happens is early on, they're thinking about empire as being about something that, you know, is about sort of European colonies in, in the world. But uh, certainly after Suez, right, so the, there's the Suez crisis, and this is the sort of um, this somewhat explicit admission that the US now will be the superpower, the UK will no longer uh, dominate world affairs. And we see the UK continues to talk about empire in terms, of it, in terms of its own uh, territories and colonies, but the US has switched to thinking about empire as being about communism, Soviet Union, um, uh, revolution, and so on. So it's kind of moved how it talks about empire. Uh, and you can, we can do things in the, in the paper like we say, these are the terms of the most American understandings of, uh, of um, empire in the 1950s. So for example, talking about Soviet communists, whereas these are the other terms on the left-hand side that are the most British. So finally, I, I, final example, I want to talk about um, uh, the EU. So one of the things that political scientists are very interested in, of course, is sort of sentiment towards things. So what we did, we, we said, well, let's look at uh, different um, uh, subject areas, um, topics that arise in, say, the early 21st century. And we're looking particularly at conservative backbenchers here. So the pattern that we observe for, say, uh, we've got education over here in this left panel and NHS in the middle and the European Union and, and, and the right, on the right-hand side, right? There's this very particular pattern that we see in Westminster uh, Parliament. So it goes like this. When your party is not in power, um, you spend a lot of time saying how bad a given, uh, given policy area is. 
And as soon as your party is in power running the show, you talk very glowingly about that policy area. So education, oh, education is terrible if I'm conservative and Labour is running it. And then as soon as my government is running it, I start to say it's great. And, you know, I start uh, having this very positive valence. And we look at this for education, the NHS and the EU. The thing to notice is in this bottom right uh, panel down here is that the EU is this one particular area we found where even though the Conservatives get a Conservative government, right, they never, they never talk about it in a very sort of uh, positive way, right? And they only start talking about it in a positive way when they get a referendum. And it turns out this leads to the, 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 um, the UK leaving. Uh, the, the EU. So it's just an example of something where um, we're able to show that uh, using these embedding techniques that they're never very positive about their own government's policy. Okay, so some concerns you may have, we can discuss these maybe more later, right? Is it sensitive to decisions that you make? Uh, well, it depends, right? Um, you know, you don't in general need to stop the documents and remove the function words because it's going to take care of it by this uh, A matrix, you don't need to send them generally. Um, you know, do I need a local similar corpus to free train on? I mean, yes, you do, but we found that uh, a corpus like Glove, which you can download in you know, a few minutes in, I let you, from the website for free, um, will handle many, many kind of modern English examples. Uh, is there uncertainty in the estimation of A? Uh, yes, um, but we wouldn't worry about it too much. We did a bunch of experiments on that, but we can return to those. So one question we often get is, you know, can this be expanded to something other than English? And the answer is yes. Um, and that's what we're working on at the moment. So if you have low data resources, you're working in a language like Upper Sorbian. Uh, I don't know much about Upper Sorbian, and if, um, so I don't want to offend any uh, Upper Sorbian speakers who may be on the chat, um, but uh, I know it's a, not a very common language and it's hard to get large corpora to uh, build up embeddings for that language. So by the way, people talk about this, you know, um, English, uh, Mandarin, these languages which are spoken, we have a lot of training data, are very easy to build embeddings for, but these other languages are tricky. So you might not just have much data, you may have low computational resources, it's hard for you to do, you know, maybe fit these embeddings models on your, on your laptop or something. So we provide them um, and we're gonna have a paper out soon about that. And uh, we're able to show in that other paper that it works very well. So you get really good nearest neighbors. So for example, if you look at something like French, right? Uh, these are good nearest neighbors. So these are kind of uh, make sense. The, the French embeddings we're providing um, uh, a sort of meaningful and be helpful to research working in foreign languages. So sort of almost wrapping up, right, I just want to make clear that we have some um, uh, software that's already out there. It's being downloaded um, fairly furiously, primarily written by Pedro on, uh, it's on CRAN. It has this particular LM style, GLM style syntax. And so what you can do here is, you know, you assign it to a model. So you're saying, let's use this context uh, function. Uh, you know, I want to regress immigration or Republican, uh, you know, as a group membership, uh, some data, some pre-training and so on, and you can have various selections and you can uh, get out uh, regression coefficients. Okay, uh, this is the main website that will take you to the paper and it will also take you to um, the software. And then finally, um, uh, my co-authors. So Pedro Rodriguez is um, a research scientist at Meta. Uh, Brandon Stewart is a professor at Princeton, he's on the call, and Elisa Vershing is a uh, graduate student at NYU. Thank you, Justin. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Arthur. I'm going to start with a couple questions, and then Steve, I, I assume you'll have some as well, and then we can open it up to the audience as well. Okay, so I mean, this is just a completely fascinating paper, and I really enjoyed it. One of the, the sort of big overarching questions I had was thinking about applying the a la carte method to different baseline embeddings. Uh, and you sort of touched on this at the end by, by you know, discussing how you, of course, want your own locally trained. Um, just sort of thinking about this going out in the world, suppose a researcher has, you know, two different embeddings, they do the a la carte on two different embeddings, they end up with regression coefficients of different magnitude, or perhaps, you know, worst case, contrasting magnitudes. How would you think about adjudicating those results? Um, and then that actually is going to tie into a second question, which might be easier just to take now, but I can, I can re-ask it as well. Um, it, it, sort of thinking about, you know, you, you do this result and you do an excellent job both in the paper and the presentation of connecting it to sort of real world implications. I'm sort of thinking, th 
thinking through, uh, you know, for the audience or for me, I have this technology, I get a, a particular result. What are the steps that should be taken in order to say, okay, this is, this is what this means. This is the sort of evidence I'd like to bring to bear to support the interpretation of this, of this regression. Yeah, um, let me deal with the second one first, actually. So what we suggest in the paper, I, um, I don't know how explicit we are about sort of these are the steps, but I, what we do in the paper is that we focus, as many other scholars do, on uh, thinking about things like, you know, nearest neighbors. So basically, I mean, just in your own work, you've written a lot about, you know, what it means to validate these things and the importance of validation. I think we would say, you know, we, we you know, do the nearest neighbors make sense, do they have to, does this embedding that you've got out for this group have the right relationship to other things that you have some reasonable prior about, right? Um, and so we would be, as usual with these things, you know, nervous about telling people to go and use them who haven't, don't have at least some, for want of a better word, like contextual knowledge about the case that they're studying. And in fact, I mean, uh, yeah, so even like looking at these uh, British MPs, uh, there, yeah, there's kind of various terms of art that you need to understand in order to know uh, whether, you know, these, these embeddings make, make sense. Um, let me return to the first one about, you know, you have two different embeddings and, you know, how would you assess between them? So I think Brandon will probably step in in a, in a second on this, but I, my feeling is that, you know, you would have to make an argument that um, the underlying embeddings the, the, the large corpus embeddings are somehow a good match for your particular substantive problem. And I, I give an ex example of this. So I've, in another paper, a separate paper, I've been working with a colleague at NYU, and we, you know, we, we were looking at uh, some 17th century documents. We don't have very many. And so it's hard to put embeddings in general in 17th century English documents. So we used some parliamentary documents and journals from uh, England at the time in, in the 17th century. And we think that's pretty close. Um, but for example, something like glove wouldn't work. Uh, and I can give a specific example. So a word like sovereign, right, in the 17th century in England is a reference you know, purely to the king. That's what it means. Um, but sovereign today in glove, uh, we're talking about sovereign debt and uh, defaulting and, and so on and so forth. Now, those words are, you know, whatever, uh, etymologically connected, um, but it, it means something different. But I'll let Brandon step in on uh, the what would you do in that event? Yeah, I think this is this is great. Thank you. Um, so I guess what I would say is like it sort of depends on how they conflict. So in um, in a setting where the magnitudes conflict, I think we're not too worried at all because the magnitudes don't really have a lot of meaning. Um, and so, and we're, we're, we try to be, you know, quite clear about that. It's, it's one of the reasons it makes sense to kind of benchmark against like function words and things like that, that we do in the paper. I think the interesting question is when different words that are sort of substantively different come out on top. And I think the, the part that's subtle here is that the, what you're getting from the magnitudes are the distance between words, and it's relative to the original embedding in the corpus. So you have to think about it in the context of whatever that original embedding was trained on. Now, we've not seen major differences between things like word to vec and glove or whatever. And, and I, I would be sort of surprised. And if you do, I would get kind of nervous that, yeah, there's just sort of it's too noisy for whatever reason the words you're looking at are too rare or the context are too strange but if you had like very context specific in um embeddings the thing i would look to is is the like is there a substantively different meaning of the focal words that like or the nearest neighbor words in the the, the corpus that you're you're trying to study um which again goes back to arthur's point about um you know uh substantive knowledge the, the other thing I'll, I'll say is that mm. one of the things that I think we, we like about this is that um, you can get pretty good nearest neighbors with even relatively few instances of the word. So like one of the things that uh, Arthur showed was um, uh, the, um, the replication of Emma Rodman's sort of really like pathbreaking work. I mean, she, was, she was at this like years before anybody else was in, 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 in uh, social science. And, um, but like one of the things about that approach is when you look at the nearest neighbors for those words, they're all 
extremely noisy because it turns out there's actually just not that many instances of the words she wants to compare, which is is fine, right? I mean, that's like the nature of historical documents. But like what we're able to show is like even when our results are very similar to her validations, you get these very rich sets of nearest neighbors that give you a much clearer sense of what's going on. And that's partly because you're leveraging this sort of pre-existing embedding base. Steve, do you want to do you want to hop in? Yeah. Yeah, so fascinating talk and paper. <clears throat> so one one thing that leaves me groping, the, the multivariate outcome vectors seemed a little unsatisfactory because it, in a particular application, might not lend itself readily to easy interpretation. So take your EU example in the, you know, back the the way it's discussed by the UK parliament. I guess it, Here's how I would have been inclined to do it, and I want to get your reaction as to what whether this is better or worse than what you did. Um, so I'd get the um, embedding vector and transform it using the A matrix exactly as you did for each instance it's instance of the EU, talking about the EU. Um, and then I guess I want to I just look at the um, sentiment score so i so, so i take take the transform vector and find the nearest neighbor or or set or some set of nearest neighbors by some criterion and then i just calculate uh, some sentiment measure for each of those nearest neighbors average them okay that gives me then a single essentially you know what's the positivity or the negativity of the sentiment um of the words that surround the usage of EU, that's my left-hand side variable, regress it on whatever you're interested in. That strikes me as both simpler than what you actually did and easier to understand the outcome. So what do I lose by doing that? I realize it shares, I'm building a lot on what you actually said, but it just seems like I've, I've tailored the outcome variable for the application of interest. And that strikes me as a probably a better way to go in many respects. That you can make similar comments about your your um partisan differences regarding the use of word illegal. I mean of, of immigration. I think much of that is basically about do you cast it in a positive or negative light? In your empire example, I think there's probably more than just that going on. It's not really positive versus negative, but the whole um, set of things that are invoked by the meaning empire is, is my guess is changing. So that that's probably going to be harder to reduce to one a one dimensional outcome without really doing serious violence to what's happening in the data. So that, that's just kind of a reaction to the way you applied the the, the methods. And I, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so for what it's worth, I mean, your description of the sentiment approach isn't far off what we do. So uh, the intuition is 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 not uh, wrong. So what we do is we say, okay, look, here's an embedding um, of uh, the EU, and let's see, uh, you know, all these conservative MPs using it, right? Um, how far is is their average embedding from uh, some the embeddings of positive words versus the embeddings of negative words? And we take some averages, and, and, and you know, and so on. So the question about the broader question about you know in this literature about what is some um, just we have a, a differential understanding of this term versus we have different sentiment towards it is a bit murky um, and there is a sort of big ish sort of sub literature now on kind of what do we mean by sentiment is is sentiment um, what is sentiment relative to um, just having a different understanding of it. But what it's worth, right? So you should be very clear. When we say understanding, what we mean by it is um, you just use it in some different way. So it is not that uh, you know you um, we literally do not understand each other uh, when we use the term abortion. It's like the entity, this thing. We could agree we understand what it is. We understand what marriage is. We understand what immigration is. Um, it's just that our use of that term differs. And that's what we are trying to pick up on. And then we're inferring that that difference in, in uh, use is a difference in meaning, and we're doing it via this sort of distribution hypothesis. 
Um, but yeah, so it's not, just to reiterate, we're not, it's not far off the way that you're thinking about the sentiment problem, and that's, that is sort of how we set it up. Um, but uh, I would, it's very murky, I think, in, in this stuff about what is sentiment, and what is just, um, uh, yeah, what is we have a different, genuinely different understanding of the term, yeah. Yeah, okay. that, 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 that's right. Um, that thought also occurred to me as I was listening to you talk, and, and, but, you know, the, the immigration one in particular in political speech, you guys are the experts, not me, but my, my sense is in political speech, the word immigration is often used to invoke either negative or positive sentiments in the audience. Um, and so there it really is about, uh, it does seem to me about sentiment more than, more than uh, meaning. But I agree in some of these other settings, it, it, it just the, the meaning itself may be what changes rather than the emotional response that's invoked. Yeah, I mean, so just, into, just to give an example of, the, uh, of a, what I think is a real meaning change rather than a sentiment change, right? So um, some of these like uh, terms, um, you know, it's these other projects we've been doing, I've been doing on say, how a term like rights evolves. That's probably not a sentiment issue. That's probably a, a, literally a question about what we, what we include in this class of object we call right. Um, and obviously for the great majority of history, it doesn't include say the right to vote. And then suddenly we think, oh yes, rights covers this other thing now. And it's not necessarily a, you know, a sentiment, it, it's, it's genuinely including something new. Um, uh, but I, uh, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky issue. I'll, I'll, I'll just say that. And we, we, don't, we don't resolve it for sure in this paper yet. Okay, uh, can we give Aaron uh, the, the chance to ask her question, please? Hi, um, hi guys, really nice to see you. Congrats on a really interesting paper. Um, so I, I, what I kept on thinking about um, was if maybe this is an extension um, or maybe it's something that you can already implement in your R package, which I haven't tried yet. Um, but what about looking at these terms in a network context? So for example, go to the, the EU, not, not, I'm not asking you to go to the side, but thinking about the EU um, plots here. So one, you know, looking at education where conservative backbenchers are very negative about education, then when they're in the office, then, then they're suddenly more positive. Another explanation for that could not be that they just, you know, they're saying they're doing a great job, but really looking at the government action words, right? So now that they're responsible for policy, they're not really talking about education the same way. They're talking about the policies that they're implementing rather than criticizing what the opposition did. Um, so, I, you know, so that to me, that sort of I would wonder if you could add, you could specify as a user, a third term, like government action or a third topic concept sort of thing, um, or more inductively, see how the associated terms change um, and sort of maybe plot that in some sort of um, interesting way. So I'm curious if you've, if you've thought about that um, and what that might look mm -hmm. like. Um, it, it makes me think of sort of a dynamic topic model, but you know, for individual words, I'm just, I'm just curious about how you might think about um, applying this in sort of a network context in which you're thinking about more like a broader set of words and interest. Thank you, this is really great work. Thank you, Aaron. I'll let uh, Brandon chime in a minute. Thanks, Aaron, very nice to hear from you. So, um, so quickly on the, um, you know, can you look at the words around this particular embedding? Yes, and actually as with reference to Justin's question, you know, um, the way to do that probably is to think, look at the nearest neighbors. So probably right when they're in the early days when they're criticizing the Labour government for education, they're moaning about their perceptions of various scandals, you know, or some issue with national exam achievement or something like this. And then they flip to the nearest neighbors become things like, well, um, we're gonna think about education as, uh, you know, endowing our citizens with these new ideas and so on and so forth. And so they're actually sort of, the nearest neighbors are changing because they're just talking about it in this fundamentally different way. And then by extension, they have some other sentiment uh, towards that. I think that's probably, I think that's probably right. Um, this actually cuts into a, a big issue that we have discussed as co-authors, which is that you need to believe, when you're, when you're making a claim that your understanding of a term is changing over any historical period, you need to believe that something is pinned down, right? So um, if we want to say that, you know, um, a word has changed in meaning, like these MPs are talking about education um, in a different way, you have to believe that other things are somewhat constant. Um, but I don't know if Brandon wants to get in on that one because um, he's given, given that some thought in the past. 
Yeah, no, 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 I, I, I completely agree. I mean, I, um, I by the way, hi, Aaron. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, it, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's a, like, that idea, particularly of, like, visualizing this, like, evolving set of neighbors is a really, really good one. Um, and it does feel like, um, it, it, I, I think I think it's like I'm trying to like imagine it like it's much easier to imagine it's like an animation than like a like a thing on a page. But um, I think the connection to the way they do the visualizations and the dynamic topic model work by like uh, Bly and Lafferty is actually a really good like invitation. I kind of wish we had done that um, in part because it would really give you a sense of like how those neighbors are changing. And that is the real power here along with being able to like drill down to particular instances and read like exactly what is happening in these particular uses of the words. Um I yeah I I I agree with with Arthur's point that this does this does raise and is a good reminder that like things things you have to believe that something is pinned down and one of the things that is um I'll, I'll just comment on that 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 is is good and bad about our framework is that the by pinning yourself to the original set of embeddings you are pinning yourself to whatever the meaning is of the words in that particular context um and so that's sort of what is held fixed and that gives you a way to interpret what's happening as opposed to everything moving together um but it also has the problem of like you become in some sense chained to whatever the meaning is in the particular um worldview you're looking at now, in fairness, I think what's good about doing that with contemporary English is I suspect that's also what's happening with our readers, right? When we say that, like, it means something like blank, presumably they're imagining in their mind the sort of contemporary meaning of that. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I really do like this, like, more explicitly leaning into the fact that you have, like, a little unweighted network here at any given time point. I have a question about perhaps studying something like discussion dynamics. Um, so, so, so for example, you're studying something like an online discussion and there's, you know, that's like Godwin's law, of like eventually if people get in an argument, they're going to mention that, that someone's a Nazi and then that sort of derails the discussion. And you can imagine mm -hmm. studying that as like a pre-post using, using exactly what you you've done already. Would it ever be useful to try to characterize like the class of things that are like Godwin's law by putting on the right hand side language embedding? So if you could, you know, th there's like one, you know, like the explicit statement, like, you know, someone is a right wing fascist and that could derail a conversation. There's a lot of ways to phrase that as perhaps recently found on Stanford's campus. And, um, uh, you might want to incorporate the, that broader thing and not have the analyst put their thumb mm -hmm. on the scale in that characterization. You can imagine lots of other things like this um, where a certain topic could come up, or sentiment could be expressed in a conversation that could lead to a different dynamic. Is there something in the embedding that can help with that or do we still want the analyst to do the characterization on the right-hand side? Very interesting idea. Yeah. So you're. Um, so firstly, yeah, I, I, I want to say that the it's very obvious to me that the um, the social center of gravity of the United States is obviously moving west. Uh, when I first arrived in the U.S., I would open up the uh, New York Times and have to read about the internal campus politics of Yale. And I'm so glad that it's moved on <laughs> to opening up the New York Times and uh, reading about the internal campus politics of Stanford now. Thank goodness. Uh, so um, on the issue of um, uh, um, just to clarify, Justin, you're interested in um, something about the idea that the the way that this term is um, is being used is moving towards other terms. Is that the idea? It, with, just even within a conversation, something like that. Yeah. So you can imagine a pre like like your elect almost like your election example where an event occurs and then there's like pre post change. Um, you can imagine in a conversation, somebody brings something up and then the whole yeah. dynamics of the conversation changes. Obviously, I can encode that manually, but I wonder if we'd ever want to use the actual language in the conversation to discover a disjuncture or something like that. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. That's, so, so I'm just thinking about sort of the, the easiest case would be something like, um, yeah, the, yeah, there's a disjuncture where the way that they talk about this one term 
um, and by extension, its nearest neighbors has moved. Uh, that's very. That's 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 a very. It'll be a very compelling case. I guess the trick would be whether you get enough data to make it in a conversation, right? Whether you get enough data to make it, a, you know, a reasonable inference problem. I don't know, Brandon, if you have thoughts about this. Yeah. Um, I think this is like very cool. And I think one of the one of the ideas in the Kodak at all piece that we're we're building on that I, I did with Sanjeev Aurora's group here um was a sort of document, like a very simple document embedding that you just sort of embed all the unigrams with a la carte, and you embed all the bigrams, and you embed all the trigrams, and then you just average the unigrams, you average the bigrams, you average the trigrams, and you concatenate them together. So if you have like a 300 dimensional embedding, you end up with like a 900 dimensional document embedding. I think just doing that for sentences and then checking um, sort of cosine similarity to these like words of interest, like fascism, et cetera, et cetera, would do that actually very easily. Um, and it would be super interesting to like, yeah, see see if there's like a, like a structural break there, but that's much more like less like word specific focused and more like document representation focused. You could also imagine, I mean, uh, the the good thing about like a straight up language model approach would also be you could think about like what's the probability that some set of words about fascism are getting invoked given the language that has appeared thus far. Um, which is like another kind of like interesting way to like pull the like probabilities out of these language models and like turn them into something of it. Okay, okay. so we, we have a couple uh, questions on the Q&A that have popped up. Could we give uh, Elizabeth Elder the chance to ask her question, please? Hi, Elizabeth. thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm also thinking about this case of kind of pre-post uh, some events changes in in the way people are using language, and I'm just thinking about the the. You mentioned that you're looking at this data from the 1700s. You know, using data from today to make the the larger set of embeddings is not going to work. But you know, I, I'm thinking the meaning of of words changes also on kind of a on a shorter time scale. Um, and so, to the extent that you're looking at changes in language pre post some event, well, meanings might also just be changing secularly over the course of that time, is there a way in which kind of using this, uh, the same set of embeddings to train, you know, to um, understand the, the meaning of the words pre and post the event is kind of, might kind of shrink or suppress differences pre post the event that you're caring about. It sounds like maybe it's just not that sensitive to the kinds of changes that happen on a 10 or a 20 year time scale, but just curious to hear a little bit more about whether we might be kind of suppressing treatment effects by by using the same, the same corpus to, to train that. Um, it certainly seems plausible to me. I mean, what, what it means to, to say, to pin any of this down, um, you, you know, you need to sort of, uh, things, ha something has to be fixed, right? And so you think about um, um, if, what are we doing under the hood, right? There's some, there's some, um, some interruption, right? And before this, in the pre-period, uh, we're taking some average, right? And then in the post period, we're taking some average. And so you need to believe that the, the thing that we're taking the average over sort of makes sense in both periods. So in that sense, absolutely, you need to believe that something is pinned down. And I think um, it probably is fine for most of our applications in you know, things like politics, but it is maybe very undesirable in some rapidly moving areas where people are talking about uh, social groups or social change or something like that, where, um, there are multiple terms within that, um, you know, social uh, group discussion, which are themselves uh, changing in terms of their in terms of their meaning, um, and that would cause a lot of problems for us because then you're taking the averages over the wrong thing, basically. Uh, but yes, it could be so. It certainly it could be suppressing uh, the effects. I don't know if Brandon has sort of Brandon's more thinking about that problem. But. Yeah, no, I, I think this is a really great question. I mean, I, I guess what I would say is that even when language is changing extremely quickly, um, so much of the language is actually staying approximately fixed um, that 
I, I think it more or less works out. So like um, we had a, an example in the paper where we're looking at the, um, uh, the difference between um, Trump pre-election and Trump post-election, where, you know, the, the sort of sense in which the name is being, I mean, same person, right? The person was a candidate before, right? It's, it's, it's just like, we're just sort of changing the distinction between how he's being talked about before the election and after. And even that's sort of getting picked up. We have no basis in the glove data, right? Trump is not even really on the political like landscape at the point when that is being trained, right? Because it's all like uh, like 2011, 2012 and pre. I mean, he's you know doing political things, but he's not a political candidate. Um, and yet we're still able to pick all of that up essentially because everything around it is still all these words about presidents and presidential candidates and things like that. And so I, I I think even in settings that are really rapidly changing, like language about the internet or things like that, it's just so much of the language is staying the same. We just don't think about it very much because like we we know what it means. And so we just, you know, move on. I, I was gonna say just maybe one case which could be very complicated actually, maybe not in terms of over time, but moving across disciplines. So if you were trying to compare, you know, like this, you have two terms in statistics that mean this, and that's not what they mean in economics or something like this. I can imagine that could be very complicated in practice. You're trying to translate between two different uh, disciplines. That could be, um, um, yeah, that, that I could imagine uh, what, it, what it means for something to be identified, right, in statistics versus economics. And then you have all these other nearest neighbors built around that. But that itself is different between the, the two two disciplines. So it could, yeah, that could be tricky, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So with that, I think we we've reached the hour. Uh, if everyone can stick around, we're going to stop the recording, and then we can uh, continue to ask uh, Brandon and Arthur some questions about this fascinating paper. Arthur, thank you so much for presenting it. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate your opportunity. Yeah.